<laughs> okay. Okay, let's, uh, let's begin. Uh, let's go back to the year 1944. I was your age. I was 18. They drafted me in the Army, and I was sworn in on uh, Pennsylvania Avenue, downtown Indianapolis. From there, I went to Camp Atterbury, which is near down south, for my uh, shots, get my hair cut, uniform, and send all my, all my civilian clothes back home. And that was an experience down there at Camp Atterbury. Camp Atterbury is an interesting place to visit sometime. You might want to go down there and check it out. I was there for about oh, a whole couple of weeks, getting everything squared away. And uh, it suddenly hit it suddenly hit me. Wow, I'm in the army. Wow. So we went down to Camp Landing, Florida, on a train, a trip train, and you you've seen these old old chugging trains that smoke and fire and puff. That's what we went on down down south. It took us three days three and a half days to get down there to Camp Blanding, Florida. No air conditioning, so guess what? We rolled up the windows, and guess what? The smoke came in all over us. Wow, three days? Can you imagine what that did to your clothes? Wow, when I got down there, first thing I did was take a shower. And I really felt good about that. I went down there and uh, down there in Florida, Camp Atterbury, excuse me, uh, Camp Blanding is near Jacksonville. It's right near Stark, Stark, uh, Florida, Jacksonville, in St. Augustine. Um, we're down there and we have dirt up here in, in Indiana. They have sand down there in Florida. So you walk on packed sand. And so all of our formations and so forth was in sand and uh, sand fleas, and uh, sand everywhere. You get up in the morning, you get up in the morning and there's sand in your bed, even after you take a shower. You can't get away, can't get away from the sand. Well, basic training down there is to teach you to be a soldier, teach you to be a killer. So that means you have to, you learn to fire all kinds of weapons. Rifles, hand grenades, machine guns, and you learn to crawl under, under, under machine gun fire. And so that's quite an experience. And it's fun, it's fun to learn how to, sh to shoot a gun, and you get, you, get, you get the feeling of a lot of power, and you do have a lot of power. You have a lot of, you have a lot of killing power. So down there, you learn to, to tell from being a boy to, to a man, you get as, as much training as possible to be responsible for yourself, be responsible for your friends, and to be, uh, have a good command of all the weapons. You have to be in good physical shape. So we did a lot of hiking, marching, and uh, we got pretty good at it. I could uh, put, on, put on my pack and run for, uh, run nine miles in 45 minutes, which is not too bad. Uh, we had a lot of physical, physical training, uh, bayonet, bayonet, bayonet work, exercises, push-ups, and also we learned to respect authority, whether we liked it or not. Yes, sir. No, sir. How? Yes, sir. And you learn to stand at attention. You learn to uh, do, uh, survive uh, inspections. And one thing else you want to know, what you learn to do down there, is, of course, is to take care of yourself. Now, Mama is not there with me to do myself anymore. I have to do it. I have to make my own bed. I have to do my own laundry. I have to stand inspection. And it's a, it's a regimen that is very good to condition your mind, but you, you don't particularly care for doing it because that's the way it is. There, that basic training is what it says is basic training. Well, you might know, you might know I had a girlfriend before I left. So when I came home, I had, I had four or five days at home from Camp Landing before I went overseas. 
So I came home and I gave my, I gave my girlfriend an engagement ring. And guess what? After the war, I married her. And guess what? We're still married. And so that, so you make a girlfriend or a boyfriend, hey, you may be able to with them the rest of your life, who knows? But anyway, that's one of, one of, the, one of the pleasures in my life is that she is still alive and we're both alive. Now then, <clears throat> so from that point we left um, uh, Indianapolis to Fort Ord. And I was at Fort Ord for a couple of weeks. Uh, more training, crawling on the machine gun fire, and uh, just general, general uh, soldierly stuff. And uh, I do remember they had a, they had a real good beer parlor right out on the ocean. That, that was kind of neat. And so it seemed like a lot of, a lot of men really like to drink. Well, they don't get too much to drink in the army. Whatever they have, what they call. 3-2 beer, which has had very low alcohol content. And so that's what you get wherever, whenever you go over there. It's not, it's not so intoxicating that you get out of hand. So I got to Fort Ord and I went to uh, Fort Lawton, uh, Washington. And uh, there were some sad, very sad days up there because all know was going to ship over. And it was rain most of the time. And what I saw one of the biggest crap games I ever saw in my life. You guys shooting dice and uh, if passing out money. And a couple of guys from Anderson, Indiana, and Japanese Nisi uh, was there, and they uh, they got all the money. I mean, they had money out their pockets and everything else. <laughs> that was funny. kind of interesting. Just, these uh, Japanese Americans were uh, had fought in Italy, and they had uh, one of the most decorated units in, in the United States Army. Went overseas in a little tiny boat, ship, what do you call it? And most of us were seasick for three or four days. And that's not very good. And you're holding on to the rail, you don't want to eat. And so that was kind of an ordeal. So then we shipped from, uh, from there to Hawaii, beautiful Hawaii. Temperature perfect. Uh, and we had a lot of jungle training there, how to, how to survive in the jungle, uh, numerous, numerous things. We, there were just four different places. We had four different places there in uh, Hawaii for all kinds of different kinds of training. And uh, that was really nice. The other thing, one thing I didn't like about, uh, about Hawaii was uh, I had to do KP. Now KP is kitchen, what they call kitchen police. And that means you work in the, you work in the you work behind the scenes in the kitchen, uh, pots and pans, you mop the floors, everything has to be immaculate. Some of the worst, the most demanding sergeants in the United States Army is a mess sergeant because he's got to keep things clean. He will anybody get sick, and he will make sure everything is perfect. I got about 3, 30 or 4 o'clock one morning there, and I was there about 9, 30 or 10 at night, washing pots and pans. I never seen so many pots and pans in my life, and these are these big guys. That was so. And fortunately, there was my name was Hill, and there was six of us guys named Hill doing pots and pans. So that's something you want to avoid, but that's what, that's part of the army life. If ever, you probably hear about people say, "Oh, I don't like to do KP." That's one of the reasons why. It's not always peeling potatoes. It's not always serving in the line. And so that's army stuff back in the back and the mop and the stuff you have to do. So anyway, that's, that's something you always remember. So I left Hawaii, went to Anahuitoc, uh, got on board ships, went to Anahuitoc, and uh, that's where I picked up a convoy, and a convoy uh, of ships always surround the troop ships to protect them from the submarines, aircraft, and so forth. And so you have destroyers around you and, and destroy escorts, and, what, and the numerous other ships are uh, uh, very important to, to protect you. And so that was that was that, that was the what we picked up our picked up our convoy. The Anna we thought it's just a small fueling station in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, let's see, let's see. Okay, I think there is a few goonie birds there. And of course, the goonie birds 
look up beauty birds on the internet. They're kind of a colorful kind of a bird. So anyway, so anyway, from, from there we shipped to uh, uh, the tropical island of Saipan. Now Saipan, uh, Saipan and Tinian uh, is where the B-29s took off to bomb Japan. And so on the way over there, we got near near Saipan. Well, we could see the B-29 bombers coming back from Japan. You see them flying low, flying high. You see them holes in holes in their wings in a fusil fuselage. You see a sm engine smoking. Now all of a sudden, you don't see it anymore. So that way was having a bombing around the clock when they bombed Japan. And so that's what the beach lines I saw. And that was uh, kind of kind of unique to see that. But it's, uh, it was more of the reality what war is really, really about. A lot of those guys did not come home. And there were, there were many, many, many planes that took off. And uh, the, um, they have completely obliterated four major cities in Japan. I've talked to some of the people that were on those bombing runs. I got to Saipan, tropical island. I was there about a month. And you see me clothes like this. We ha everybody has to keep their clothes like this. Have all everything's all tight because of uh, people don't want malaria. They won't get bit by mosquitoes. And so they don't want to get sunburned either. You can get court martial for being sunburned because it put, puts you out of action. So, during your training, the clothes were wet. Guess what? You had to wash your clothes every night. Every night, wash your clothes. I've been to the chow line there in the, in the chow hall. Hot, so hot there, you're sweating. There's sweat while you're, while you're sit, trying to eat. And Australian meat and beans is not very neat, especially when you would rather eat mama's cooking than Australian meat and beans. Pass it if you can. Anyway, I had about a month's training there on Saipan. We learned, we learned to shoot rifles in, in the uh, basic training with, like this. But when we were trained on Saipan, we, we learned to fire from the hip. It's a lot quicker. You don't have to take time to go up here. If, if you take time to pull your rifle up like here, you may be dead. So we learned to fire from the hip. We also learned to fire machine guns from the hip. We also had some uh, real jungle training. And one of the significant things, well, one of them wasn't significant, but there was some, there was some Jap head body out there somewhere, or American body out there still. They, they hadn't disposed of it. You could smell the wind blow, right? That was a little bit. Anyway, we even tried some uh, battle statistics and uh, maneuvers at night, and that's not very good. You, you have a hard time keeping track of who's where, where you're going. And, that, and we went on that exercise just to prove how dangerous it was. But I want you to know something. The Japanese were very good at it. They were so good at it, they trained at it. They come, trained to come and slit your throat at night. They even had spaceless shoes. Their shoes were split so they could, so they could walk around there in, at night. They had more control. I had it about a month straight in there on Saipan. It was a significant, uh, significant from a basic training and other training I had. There we were, this is, this is a real thing. And we were in pretty good shape. We could hike, we could hike a lot, you know, in, in the tropics. And being 18, you can relate, relate to the fact that you still got a young body. Your body functions pretty well if you take care of it. You, and now uh, we had, we had pretty good food, but the, the, all through the army, we had, we had pretty good food except there on that island. I mean, I write about it because you know I, I remember it. Uh, so, oh, by the way, the story, my story, my infantry story is on the website. There's a lot more detail. So I'm just hitting the highlights here with some of this stuff. Now, <clears throat> we developed good friendships. Uh, you, somebody had a, 
some friend of mine was uh, in basic training, and I kind of lost contact with him. He's from Bruceville, Indiana. Uh, we were buddies uh, all through the Army. And so uh, <clears throat> I want you to remember that's what happens. Uh, in, in, in the Army, you, you begin to get buddies and friends, and, you, and they're, they're friends for life. And for this, this gentleman by the name of Ralph Alton, uh, we were, were in basic training. We're st I was still in contact with him all as long as he lived. He passed away about four years ago. But uh, you make these lifetime buddies. There's a lot of camaraderie in the service. So when, so when we, uh, okay, so when we <clears throat> uh, get ready to leave Saipan, we all knew we was going to go into combat. And so every day was closer. So <clears throat> we, had a we had a recreation hall. People go over there and play ping pong, play cards after, after our training. And on the last night, we had a, had a song fest. And one of the men got up, and he says, uh, I just got a telegram from the War Department. My brother in Italy died, he's killed. He said, would you sing my buddy? And it goes like this. Nights are long since you went away. I think about you all through the day, my buddy. My buddy, your buddy, misses you. Well, kind of set us back on our heels. Emotional. Here this man lost his brother, and we're all getting ready to go into combat. And guess what happened next? He got up again. He says, would you sing it again? So I'd like for you to join me and sing, my buddy, for all those guys that never made it back. Can you do that with me? Nights are long since you went away. I think about you all through the day. My buddy, my buddy, your buddy misses you. Thank you. Thank you, brothers. So <clears throat> we got on board ship. And we got talking about that particular incident. And we took about, I'd say, six or seven days to get to Okinawa. Well, we had to keep, keep in physical shape, which we did. We got, into, got to play cards, and, uh, and the Navy kept, kept cleaning the decks, and the Navy did a good job taking care of us. Another big convoy took us was circulating our troop ship. And that was kind of neat because I could see their flags and their flashes. See their, they, uh, you could see them and, and they're riding really low in the water. But it was kind of interesting seeing that. And so we're, here we are, about a seven days, and we're zigzagging. So the Japanese submarines can't find us. So, <clears throat> So well, here we come on Okinawa, coming up into Okinawa. Over here was a big black, it was a big plume of smoke over here. And the skies were kind of overcast. You see the smoke over there. I'd, we, didn't, we couldn't know what the, what the reality was. Was there a plane down? Was there an ammunition blown up? What was that? It kind of a, kind of a impression on our mind. So we kept getting closer and closer, kept getting darker and darker. So that was time for us to go. They have everything imaginable. We had a full field pack, at least 40 pounds, a rifle, a uh, gas mask. Why? Every, I, I, they didn't know what, it had to be, we had to prepare for everything. Rifle, and then they gave us two extra bandoliers of ammunition to put over our shoulders. 
it was hard just standing up. So anyway, we came, came in closer, and there was a, over on the left side, there was a bright light. We couldn't figure out what that was either. So it came time for us to, to go on, to go over, over the side of the ship, down the cargo nets. Now you've all seen these, you've all seen these pictures of the car guys going on the cargo nets. Well, <clears throat> this, when you get out of cargo net, your ship's going like this. It's not completely steady. It's just shaped just like this. So when you go over the top, you kind of, kind of balance yourself, and everybody puts their feet down. Uh, well, obviously, I walk on somebody else's hands, and he's walking on, I'm walking, and somebody else is walking on my hands. So we're going down those nets backwards, you're turned over to your face in the ship. But this landing ship, it's also shaking too. So it's scraping the ship back and forth, and you kind of get down there, and you just hope you can get in that thing without breaking the legs. So I jumped down into that, and then everybody kind of lined up. Now this is what the Higgins boat, you probably see these big landing boats, you probably see pictures of them. Uh, they're the ones that come crashing into the deck, crashing into the beach, and then the front of it drops down and everybody runs out. That's the type of ship. Higgins boats, I think they're made, some of them were made here in Evansville, Indiana. So, they were on this ship, and they're, they're on those, all these troops all, all, off on all these ships, these Higgins boats. There must have been, oh, 15 or 20. Now, they don't all line up this way, because if the enemy artillery comes in, they can knock off every one of them. So what happens is they kind of maneuver around, so they, they're not easy targets. But it's like I said, over there on the left side was this glow. We got closer, we found out it was a hospital ship, all illuminated. A hospital ship. And in front of us were ambulances. Four, four five, and six, in each ambulance was a very badly injured soldier or Marine. We watched that for 20 minutes or half an hour. All these men being, being wounded. That'll wake you up. What am I headed into? This is reality. The truth is, on Okinawa, they filled three of those ships before I got there. Before I got there, they was filled three of them. We lost a lot of men. And so, when I came in, I came in as a replacement. Replacement for all those that, that, that are gone. So I walked in there, my turn. Boy, it felt good to have my feet on the ground. I bounced my load, my, I crawled in, went up there, followed in through there, and it had been raining. Came over there and we all dug our foxholes. Oh, by the way, infantry people live in and on the ground. You know, the reason you have a foxhole is you get down below the artillery, you get down below the bullets. So you learn to dig a hole pretty, pretty well, and you dig it so that you can survive. So, <clears throat> well, I, I did a lot of foxholes, and I'm still here today. So, I dug foxholes that night, got up the next morning, just like springtime in Indiana. The weather was kind of a, a, a few clouds here, clouds there, happy, like a happy spring day. Some, we're looking forward to a few of them coming up. Get, get, get winter past, get, get rid of winter. So, there we are. We had a chance to load up on ship, excuse me, load up on trucks to take us to our different units. And so, they went to about, I don't know, several, several units. We, of course, we didn't, know, didn't know exactly what was going to happen. So anyway, I pulled in here, got off my truck, got off the truck, and down, and here we are, this is going to be my outfit, M Company, 382nd Infantry Division. 
96th Division Dead Eyes. That's our logo. I joined the, had a very proud outfit. There was many as 30,000 in my division. In my particular uh, company, there were about 180 men. Right now, today, none of those men are alive. I'm the only one standing of that 180 men. That's why I have my website to control, to, to record their stories. That's one of my missions in life, to, to remember the dead eyes. So I went in there, and the first thing we had, they brought us some fruit salads. Fruit salad? Now I hadn't had fruit salad for a year. Well, I thought, man, I felt pretty darn good about that. Boy, this is all oh, oh, going to be all that bad after all, you know. So I anyway, went down there, and there was my buddy from basic training, Ralph Alton. He said, "Hell, I'll tell you what, let's do. Let's go over here and dig our own fox hill." Yeah, we're both what? We're both Hoosiers. Yeah, let's do that. So we did. We dug our own fox holes. So I turned into my ammunition. Now I'm now I'm in a mortar division, mortar mortar uh, company. I don't use a big M1 rifle, the big ones. I use the smaller carbines. The smaller carbines, as uh, they're still 30 caliber, but they're up for shorter range, and I'm actually more functional. Uh, I think they're more functional. Um, so, anyway, then because we're part of a mortar squad, I, I had a big pouch. I carried mortar shells. Uh, some heavier, some heavier than light. They smoke. Some were smoke, and some were heavier than others. But that's what my job was. Because I'm 18, everybody else has a better job. I'm just, yeah, I'm just a, I'm just first. I'm, a, I'm just a green. I, I'm not even, you know, it's just, I'm just a little man on the totem pole. But it had to be done, so I had to carry ammunition. So, so it's not, a, it's not very illustrious. I come to you and say, well, guess what you did in the war? Oh, I carried ammo. I did. I wasn't running the machine gun. I wasn't. I wasn't a flyboy. I wasn't the guy in the ships of, of bombs, this and that. I carried ammunition. So, anyway, there were, I, yeah, as you see, I had some. I had some pretty good experiences. So, Alton says, "Well, Hill, how would you like to go to a movie? A movie? Wow, that'd be kind of neat. Well, oh, sure, let's go. You'll bring your raincoat." You'll need to set, have something to set on. I we had ponchos, roll up ponchos. So I went down to see the movie. They had a projector, sit down here, we're going to see a movie. I haven't seen a movie in God don't know how long. I sit down there, and all of a sudden we hear the air raid signs, air raid sirens. Air raid sirens? You mean we can't watch the movie? So, 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 so here we come back, here we come back, and man, they were, they were, they were this, uh, fired at this bomber flying over. Shrapnel fall. Guess what we did? We went into one of the old Japanese uh, emplacements that they dug, they dug here for years, 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 ago, years ago, getting ready for the Americans to come in. They had this emplacement, and we went down inside there, and was, you could see where they, if they had a machine gun there, they had perfect control over this valley. We came in there to get away, to get away from the shrapnel coming down. Whenever you, you really shoot those, those shells up at that plane, the shrapnel's got to go somewhere and it comes down. So fortunately, it wasn't a hit by the shrapnel. Now then, whenever, you, whenever they fire at a web, uh, fire in the sky, they have tracers. Not every fourth or fifth shot is a tracer. And as this Japanese bomber came over, you could see it just like an umbrella. An umbrella followed him around from all the, from all the different angles. Well, this, this particular night, this, this plane came over and it bombed this, it was ammunition depot, it, it bombed this ship and blew up this ship and it was full of ammunition. But it was just a big explosion. And this pilot drove, drove his plane back over here and he was flying so low, and there was so much flack and stuff around, I could see his face. 
I said, my gosh, this guy's got more, more guts than I have to fly across there and fly back. Man, I have to respect the man for his uh, guts. But anyway, we knew he wasn't going to make it back. They, they, would, they would destroy him before he got back. But that was kind of interesting. So, that night, one of those nights while in there, I had to pull guard duty. Now, it's very consistent in the Army that people pull guard duty so everybody else can sleep. You take turns, a couple hours a time. So I'm on guard duty. Pitch dark. I mean, try it sometime. Close your eyes. Go in a closet somewhere, close your eyes, and imagine you're, you're, you're on guard, and you're going to protect everybody. You got your weapon handy. I, my first, first job as, as an on guard duty was a two-hour stint in total darkness. I got my weapon here. I got the safety off. Try that for two hours. Are you, you get a little jumpy? Yeah, absolutely, you get a little jumpy. But anyway, that was my first experience of guard in combat. I was, that was in a combat area. Try it sometime. So, it come time for us to go up front. We, had, we were, uh, I joined this outfit and they pulled back for a rest. It's time for us to go up front. So Alton and I are 18 year old kids. We're one of the last we get ready, get ready, get, you know, had to cover up. We had to cover, we had to fill in that foxhole in the mud. Slide around in the mud, raining like crazy. Clothes were wet. Just, we're just hustling, trying to get everything done. <clears throat> we go down and get my ammunition. They'll carry these mortar shells. So we lined up, got out there, and they got on these trucks. They dropped us off in about 20, 25 minutes, and then we began hiking in the mud. Boots up here to here, mud up here, here, raining on you. And I would say, when the ponchos, you put your ponchos on or raincoats, the water runs down, and then it runs down here, and then it runs down in your shoes. So I'm sloshing, sloshing, sloshing. Don't worry about my feet getting wet, because they're going to be soaked, they are soaked. So, we hiked, we hiked for, oh, another 20, 25 minutes in the rain. And you know what? I am part of an outfit. I'm part of the other guys. These men are all 20, 25, 30 years old. They're combat veterans. They've already been through the lady, I don't know, the battle for the lady. I'm gonna be with them guys. I'm gonna be a man with those guys. Wow. I felt those guys were so tough they could walk through a brick wall. I had a lot of respect for the fellows I was working with, the men I was with. with. So I dropped us off. Now it's time to take a foxhole. But guess what? Okinawa is rocks. You don't dig a foxhole. You take rocks and you pile them up and you put your, and you put your tent over top of it. The reason why you have a tent it's so you don't get rain on all night. We want to sleep in the rain all night. That's why we have tents. Now, other times you don't have tents because if you're on front line, you don't have you don't have any tents. But we had we we're fortunate enough. We had tents because we're we're not right on the front line. We are in support with these mortar these mortars. Now mortars is a small small cannon. You can elevate them different levels. And you can have different kinds of shells. You can have smoke shells. You can have that, that in there. You can have shrapnel shells. But this is the kind of a weapon we had. So I'm carrying all this ammo. And so we dug a hole and, and uh, had ERC rations. I forgot to tell you, C rations, we have three, six cans of C rations we have every day. Not the best, but you, you can survive on it. So, we could not sleep that night. Artillery shells were firing all night long. 
bang, bang, bang. Well, uh, Okinawa is a series of hills. So all you, all you do is hear the echo. The yeah. artillery shell goes off, goes bang, goes bang, 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 bang. I could not sleep. I got, finally got to sleep about maybe 4 o'clock in the morning. Rain, soaked the clothes of weight. Me and my friend from Indiana, we, 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 we didn't, we piled our rocks up, but we were kind of lazy. We didn't, we didn't make it very big, so we, so we slept together, all bundled up together. That was kind of interesting. But we, anyway, <laughs> that's the way I was the first night. So, um, then we got up, now we're going to move up into our positions. The 77th Division, no, 7th Division, uh, we were going to replace the 7th Division. They were going to go back for rest. We were going to take care of, going to take care of place. So I went around this, went around this hill, and all of a sudden I saw a landmine. Now a landmine is meant to destroy trucks, tanks, whatever. There's a landmine right in the tracks. So when any other American uh, tank or truck would come through there, it would blow them up. My question. How did the Japanese slip through our lines, drag that thing and put it there? Japanese are very good at slipping around at night. And like I said before, they will slit your throat in the middle of the night. They're good at it. This was slipped through the lines and put that a couple of miles, at least maybe maybe a half a mile anyway, they put that on there. Dangerous, treacherous. Now I want to tell you how treacherous the Japanese really are and why we hate them so much. Almighty, my friend of mine, they were going to patrol. They were going to come, go make a patrol and come back. He said, the one guy wasn't feeling very good. So they went on patrol and came back. And the Japanese had found him and had skinned him alive and took all his skin off him. Could you learn to hate somebody like that? Pretty easy, couldn't you? Would that motivate you? Would you remember it? Would you seek revenge? In conscience? And out of that, we had some had some men that was in a hospital, a little hospital ship, a little, little hospital uh, area, and a Japanese came out to those wounded soldiers in the makeshift hospital and clubbed them all to death. So that's why, that's why we hated those Japanese. So anyway, we went this, past this mine, and over here is a bridge, and there's a jet, Okinawa woman with her baby, dead underneath there. I was surprised. I didn't. I had thought about civilians dying. I anticipated Japanese dying, but not this. I was surprised. So anyway, we took the place of the, of the seventh division, and we had, we had we had very good foxholes. They had nice foxholes. We just took over. We took over. We had tents. And so we just changed the blankets, and we had, and they're very good. That was a very good, very good place for us to be. Well, as an 18-year-old, wait a minute. From that, from that point, we set all of our our motors in place. They fired them. We loaded up. We brought in gasoline and water and ammunition. Stacked all the ammunition up, ready for this combat situation. Because we're in, we're in support of the infantry, and we're going to we have all these. Uh, I just support, we have all this ammunition ready. We get to all that done, we sit down, we got our sea rations, sit down, Melton and I was talking about what all we'd seen. And over here, there's about 25 or 30, maybe 50 men walking. All fresh uniforms. These men were going up front. A lot of those guys, 
will not be alive by the end of the day. There too were replacements too. That's something to watch. I got a picture of that on my website. So being young men, we want to explore. So we went out exploring and then we found an army tank. And this army tank had a big hole, about way big. So we crawled inside this tank, see what we could find. And there's an American soldier's leg down there on the bottom. And the maggots were working on it. Sacred ground. We came out of there and I found two dead Japanese soldiers over here, been laying in the sun for two or three days. They've all swollen up the mouth like that. Anyway, I came back around there. And so from that point, we stayed there for about Oh, I'd say a week, about a week. As, a, as American troops went ahead forward, they would take these uh, uh, mortars out, mortar gun, mortars, and we'd lower, lower the elevation so they, so they could uh, uh, get to where they were, protect them. Now, a mortar shell is not as big as artillery shell, but they have a very, they have very accurate, you can, you can drop those shells in just by any place. You see the pattern, or you, you drop them by, what you do, you zero them in, so then when you fire them, you fire them, you know exactly where they're going to go. But they're not, they're, uh, they're not, they're, hand grenades are uh, really small, much smaller than, than a mortar shell, and a mortar shell is much smaller than an artillery shell. But they have shrapnel, the shrapnel will, will um, spread out and kill, and have a, have a, have an area that they are covered. So we fired, we fired, I fired there several times, and we uh, there. Some of our American American men were trapped, and so we fired up smoke. We fired up smoke so they could they could carry the wounded out, and uh, and that was one one of the ways we had it, of uh, bringing our wounded back. Uh, from that point, I helped carry stretchers, helped carry some of the wounded back on the stretchers, and uh, you had to swat the flies away. And the flies are uh, uh, about big as about bigger to thumb. Uh, they, they come from the dead, uh, dead bodies. So when they carry these men back, if they if they know there's blood around, they attack, try to attack the blood. You have to swat the you have to swat the, the flies off the guys that you're carrying back to the aid station. So, we, uh, we fired, we were there for about, like I say, 10 days or so. And we had, about, ni about every night those artillery shells came in. Now, we set up you know, mortar shells, mortar platoons are set up behind hills. So they call what they call a defilade position. So they won't get they won't get dropped. They, the artillery shells artillery shells will go over the top of your head. So anyway, I was on guard today one night. I crawled up behind her. There's a cut in her. There's a cut up up here, and there was an ammunition layer. And we were up there to um, to guard this ammunition dump. Well, the artillery shells came in on us. I mean, they come screaming in. Man, they were really, it was the heavy stuff coming in. And they were crashing in, and it was shaking the ground, the dirt was flying down. Man, I've never seen anything like this. Six, seven big shells coming in. Bam! Uh, echoing around. And all of a sudden, here comes a piece of shrapnel right toward us. You could hear, I could hear it coming, and it crashed in beside us on the hill. And that piece of shrapnel was almost about half the size of my hand, about like thick as my hand. Blue steel, sharp edges, razor sharp edges, and jammed right in the, right with the hill, right beside me. Too hot you couldn't even handle it. That's pretty close. Now, but it's kind of strange, I could hear it coming. 
But anyway, I was glad that was, I was glad and that night was over. They come, come back down and talk to guys. Oh, was you guys up there? So? I see you, see you made it back. <laughs> Those sour grapes, sir. So anyway, <clears throat> now it's time to move forward. We move our, move our guns forward. The American troops have taken these hills ahead of us. Now it's time for us to move up. Anyway, we strap on our stuff and take off. And start over here. And over here, on my right side, is a pile of Japanese soldiers. They were at least about 10 feet high, uh, 20 by 20, pile of Japanese soldiers. And they were burning them up with a flamethrower. Kind of sacrilegious. If they were diseased, what are you going to do? So that's how, that's how you dispose of the bodies. So, <clears throat> came down here and we dug in more foxholes. And a Japanese soldier had slipped through during the night. We threw up a flare. And I could hear him. He was trapped down in a bunch of bushes. And I could hear him crying like a baby. They threw up a flare and a soldier came in and, and blew him away. The next morning, we got... All of them I had to go see what happened. Three fourths of these brains are blown out, blown away. Made right there. We hated the Japanese and we got rid of them. By the way, our division, our division is credited with getting, with take, we killing 30,000. We, our end division, killed 30,000 Japs. You see how bad it was? You see how much combat there was? You'd be surprised how many million rounds of Ammunition was fired. At least five, five million rifle shells. Five million machine gun shells on that island. That island is 60 miles long, five miles wide. So, let's see. Okay, so then from that point, we went around to the uh, Went around through another area, and all of a sudden I heard a noise. Like a ping, ping. A Japanese soldier had taken and hit his helmet with his shell, with his, hel with his, hit a grenade on hit his own helmet. That's what actuated him, and he put it in his stomach and blew himself up. I went by him, and he smoked, he was still smoking. Came around there. And then I was on, uh, we were at the end of a plateau. We dug our foxholes in again. And we had, we had set, up, set up trip flares. We set these wire, they have wires, so if somebody walk by, they trip this flare, and they'd be illuminate, the, the, the flares would pop. So, I was at the end of this plateau, they put, excuse me, plateau, this night I had my I had an automatic rifle. Bang! The flare went up and there were two Japanese soldiers there and I drove them. They must have been far away or just beyond that curtain. But they're far. Now, I didn't know if, if there's gonna be more Japs. I had to worry about getting my loaded loaded my gun again. The next morning I found out there was two dead Japs. Did I kill them? I don't know. Do I care? No. Is me or him? I'm here to tell my story, and he's not. That's the way it is, guys. So, from that point, uh, he moved around, saw some Japanese soldiers come back that they captured, saw some Americans, Americans Americans being hauled back on trucks that were dead, and you could see their bodies shaking. You know, Rick and Mortis has always said that. And so from that point, <clears throat> the war was uh, declared over. We'd lost a couple of generals, and we got back to clean showers. And that was very nice. And 
that they have some big tents. We got a cot to sleep on, which is very nice. But then a typhoon came in. We had to leave. We loaded on, so we loaded on these ships. I got on the LST, and we loaded all, the, all our tanks and our trucks and our, every gear we had. And I'm on the, and I'm on this I'm in this hurricane or typhoon. You talk about being seasick and scared. I mean, that old ship was hitting those waves, shaking. You could shake the ship. Well, I was an adventuresome guy. I'm still 18 years old, guys. So I go on top ship, on the top ship, on top board, on top, the deck up there, to see how much I could stand. And those waves just rising, and rising, smashing across the ship. Man, I had enough of it. I just go back down below. <laughs> that was something else. That's in my story, too. Anyway, seasick another three or four days. And then all of a sudden, there's a notice on the, on the bulletin board. We dropped an atomic bomb on Japan in Nagasaki. Wow. You mean, maybe I anticipate all, you mean the war might be over? And then they dropped the second one. And boy, we were jubilant. Jubilant, yes. We're not going to have to, they, they were gonna, the Japanese are going to surrender us early after all this. Wow, you can imagine. We knew that going to the mainland Japan was going to be a big problem. So, I landed on the island of Mindoro. Glad to be there. We celebrated, the Navy celebrated shooting shells up. And the war was over. Atomic bomb saved a lot of lives. Very cruel, but saved a lot of lives. It was worth it. That's not, that's hardly even worth being debated. That's what happened there. Now, they say that we were part of the greatest generation. Uh, I accept that. That's fine. But, 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 this next generation come along, you're just as tough as we are. Don't tell. I have a lot of faith in young people. You're going to be just as smart, or as dumb, just as smart <laughs> as we were, and you do what's necessary. Now, war is a bad way to settle things. To give you an example, let's suppose everybody in here had little daggers. Boy, that wouldn't be too good, would it? But let's put it on a bigger scale. We don't need all these weapons. We don't need this violence. It's a bad way of settling things. Let's settle things with our minds rather than with the killing. Because that's one thing <clears throat> The greatest generation did. We wanted peace. Why, and of course, that's when the United Nations was started. So you can see, you can see the kind of ramifications of this. So now, we live in a great country. And I'd like for you all, if you will, to sing America. Can we do that? Okay. My country, tis of the sweet land of liberty, of the I sing. Land where my fathers died, land where the pilgrims fell, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. Thank you. <laughs>